Our speaker this evening has held prior roles as VP of R&D, CTO, lead data scientist, but currently he is the CEO and co-founder of Data Cool. Please welcome Florian Duetu. Hi everyone. Uh, I hope, you're, I hope you're, you're, you will like the, the t-shirts. Um, so I, I wanted to share with you tonight some thoughts about the, the loneliness of uh, data team managers, meaning all the people responsible for setting up platforms, setting up teams, and so on, and how lonely that job can be. So to give you some context, um, I must first admit that I have got some like uh, highly nerdy back background, <coughs> which you can infer from the, the t-shirts, obviously, but like from 20 to 30, uh, most of my actual life was about uh, building uh, type systems, garbage collectors, uh, doing networks, analytics, and NLPs, this kind of stuff. <coughs> and so, um, well, obviously I was using as tools, uh, I guess, mostly Emacs or Vim, and I think I started to use uh, Eclipse in 2011, but switching back to Sublime uh, one year after. So you get the picture. And so to sum it up, I would say that I used to hate graphical user interface, which makes sense, I'm a, I'm a developer. And so the thing is, what I'm building in my company today is a kind of a supercharged visual IDE for data science, which is a highly paradoxical to me, meaning how did I get so low, meaning I'm actually building a user interface for developers. That I, that's very, very strange to me. But the thing is, it kind of makes sense to actually provide productivity tools for data scientists. And so what's uh, also strange to me is that we, we got some success into actually selling uh, this product for about two years with uh, growth and customers starting to use it and so on, uh, as you can guess. So to give you the, the, the background of uh, this, why is it relevant to to actually the loneliness of the data uh, team manager, I need to, to tell you a little bit of a story. And so the story begins with a guy, this guy, let's name it Al, Al alone. So imagine picture Al as a, you get it? Yeah. <laughs> imagine Al as like a, the head of business intelligence in a medium-sized company, maybe two or three years ago. He actually built most of the BI stack in the company, providing reports, analyzing the web traffic, or uh, whatever is required for the business to run. It was pretty hard to, to make the things scales and reliable and so on. He has a pretty tough job. And so one day, his boss, uh, let's name it Bill, so the CEO of the company, just after uh, some uh, weekend at a golf course uh, talking with McKinsey people, would come to him and say, hey, we really need to do big data. <laughs> it's highly important to our growth, all our competitors are doing it. Uh, it's critical that we do use it operationally to personalize the user experience, to build a recommender system, to do whatever else required to make dynamic pricing or whatever. But yeah, the, obviously, in fact, Dim is right. And so the thing is that Dim will just come to uh, Al's office. Well, actually, because Al is head of business intelligence, he probably doesn't have like a actual private office. So let's say he comes to uh, Al desk in an open space. And probably Al is like a manager of one, meaning he manages his own team of himself. <laughs> uh, and so he, he just got this big roadmap of building a big data platform from scratch. So obviously he probably has some data around, like uh, two or three years of logs of the website, probably uh, not taxed that well, highly unclean, because the data in uh, his true form is unclean, as you all know. And so he starts wondering uh, what to do, hence he starts scratching his head. 
you can see here. <laughs> and so, uh, first and foremost, you will start uh, maybe uh, going to some uh, meetups or events uh, such as uh, Strata, which was uh, today, or meetups such as this one, to discover what to do. And so, first thing to do for him is to uh, try to figure out what is the actual technological stack to use, what tools. Yeah. So, uh, when you consider the, the kind of uh, technological landscape we have today, we are in a technological landscape where you've got uh, many, many, many available technologies. And so possibly you've got like five, six, seven domains uh, where you need to make some choice, like which SQL database, which underlying storage for very, very large volume of data, what kind of machine learning framework to use, if any is required, uh, what kind of visualization layer do I need, and uh, maybe you've got some SQL database for uh, more transactional aspect or more uh, key value uh, access aspect and some other for more uh, analytical payload and so on. And so at the end, uh, I like to think of our, of today, of, uh, our landscape today as a, a kind of a, an old country of uh, Europe, Technoslavia, where you've got all those domains and lots of available technologies. And so the, the, the real problem is that for any of those domains, you have like five, six, seven pretty good technologies. Meaning it's not like you've got uh, one good technologies and 10 other crappy ones. You've got five, six, seven pretty good technologies that you don't know, and you don't know which one to, you to actually choose. Like, should I, well, which SQL database should I use today? And should I go for a full GS, uh, shiny kind of visualization or uh, use a pre-built tool such as Tableau? Should I go for uh, open source in SQL or should I just use uh, the free version of uh, HP Vertica, which is pretty useful, and so on and so on and so on. And so, uh, obviously, when you've got like uh, uh, seven possible choice for uh, seven domains, you don't have like uh, 49 uh, possible uh, technology stacks, but you have like seven power seven possible seven power seven possible technology stacks, which is around. Anyone can guess seven power seven? Come on, you all have iPhones. Seven power seven? <laughs> well, it's it's around uh, I think eight hundred thousand something like that possible technology stacks, which is a lot. Even if you set up an algorithm and try each one, it can take, it, it can take you some time to get the, the right one. So that's the first uh, problem for Al. Another one, so I, I think, well, maybe uh, after getting to some uh, conference, you can make some choices and decide that depending on the size and payload and what is comfortable with, you can start choosing some uh, platform. Then you have possibly some problem in front of you. First one is that, for instance, if you decide to set up an Hadoop cluster, here is a big, possibly a big uh, issue, which is that it could underinvest in terms of setting up Hadoop, for instance, have some things that would be slow to use, not responding that well, and possibly uh, perceived as slower than the existing business intelligence stack you could just build, like a toy platform from the perspective of the end users, just because each query would take like uh, one or two minutes to actually answer, if it does not actually set up things well. And so it's, it's very dangerous to set up a toy platform when you are someone building uh, and deploying things into uh, inside companies. And so obviously here, what you need to do is either invest in skills or learn by yourself or hire someone to do things right or use a prepackaged solution such as a cloud solution or even perhaps buy an appliance or whatever to get things right. He has other, more subtle problem in front of him. Because when he, when he choose a technology, he might enter in some uh, kind of political realm. So for instance, imagine he, he just decides to do Python. Python is cool. It's a real programming language. You can um, do things uh, in a very scale way using Python and so on. But it might be that inside the company, there are some people that just love R and want to use R. So, what shall he do? 
Again, you might just want to, to use a Spark to do everything, but it might be that uh, there is some like uh, um, geo analytics team inside the company that is uh, all into Postgres because Postgres is great for geo analytics. And so, what would it do? Would it just make everybody use a Spark and just deploy that on the cluster or, and on the platform and so on? That's a great question. And so here, the, the key question is: Should he like be uh, a dictator and impose some uh, some technological vision, or assume that uh, things are more complex than that, and uh, that you need to be polyglot in a sense when you are setting uh, setting up the technological platform these days? Actually, it's not an obvious choice. I mean, I, I think I think that both. Choices are right. You can be a very, very good dictator if you've got a right, the right technological vision. The only problem is when you are uh, not choosing and are sometimes a dictator and sometimes a polyglot. Because uh, polyglot dictators are, are uh, very rarely successful. Thank you. <laughs> then, last but not the least, in terms of technology, he has this big question when you are specifically talking about uh, analytics, kind of payload about how you set things up uh, into production. Meaning, you can use analytics, deploy lots of good things, deploy insights, but usually a big barrier is to actually get them to the point where uh, those analytics stuff, those predictive models run uh, in a variable fashion every day, every day of the week, and so on. And so, it's, it's in my perspective, pretty important because if you think about the, uh, all the companies that were successful in the last 15 years, one thing they had in common was the fact that they were able to just release their uh, fucking website pretty, pretty fast. Meaning they, become re they became really, really good at just deploying the website. They almost created a world culture of deploying websites effectively and managing the versioning and stuff like that. And so probably uh, the companies that will win uh, over the five next year in the great age of uh, distributed artificial intelligence uh, over uh, connected devices and the cloud would be companies that will be effective in terms of uh, deploying uh, models and predictive intelligence in production. So here again, you must uh, set up some uh, uh, specific architecture, like uh, an architecture where you can uh, design things, but also put things in production, automate your workflow and the way you, you merge data together and create new models, and also, and also a zone where you can actually integrate in real time with your APIs and so on. So when Al starts having uh, things uh, almost connected in terms of technology, he might enter into something more complex, which is that uh, if you, if you really want to scale data inside this company, he has like some people problem. I mean, all interesting problems in the world end up being uh, problems with people. Okay. And so here's the question for Al is, uh, well, first, how, how, shall we, how shall we start this new data team as ordered by team? Should we just uh, use it as an extension of the existing business intelligence team? So obviously, whatever happens, you will need to uh, get into this team new roles, meaning new job titles, like data analysts, data scientists, data engineers that will uh, need to work together and uh, implement new business needs around uh, personalization and so on, but also be able to deal with existing IT constraints. So here, a big human resource problem is about managing expectation. Because first and foremost, all those people who will have been hired with those new shiny titles, especially uh, data scientists, but might have a different real life inside the company. And, uh, come on. Uh, if you are a little bit into data, you have been most, most probably a data cleaner for almost uh, one week in the last year. If you did any hands-on stuff, you had to actually clean up stuff in a way. And uh, you don't want your data engineer 
to be uh, just someone that is connecting uh, pipelines and uh, try to fix things that didn't work the last, uh, during the last weekend. And you don't want the data scientist to be just uh, someone that uh, run an experiment, then wait over this desk, so that the model finished, has uh, finished computing and so on, possibly drinking too much coffee, and then speaking really, really, really fast. <laughs> so that's the first problem. Then he has another problem, which is about specifically managing the data scientist. Because if he, if he, if he hired a data scientist, it might be someone which is, uh, uh, well, passionate about data, creative, that uh, understands business, uh, but so is hard to hire, is hard to retain, and so on. And so just because you understand business and technology and stuff like that, and think it does that better than him, he might just want to take a job. So it's really pretty dif difficult for him to manage uh, this data scientist. So in that case, Al might have a Another perspective, which is something that's interesting, which is that because those data scientists are so hard to actually get into the team, especially at scale, you might want to try to pair uh, someone coming from a complete engineering background and that knows the existing IT pretty well, and someone coming more from the business side and uh, that understands the business issues, but is also uh, sufficiently data savvy to actually get into the data. And so I like the, this idea that you need to at some point pair uh, someone which is uh, able to fight the, the data entropy, meaning someone which will try to find patterns with someone whose job is to make things work. Because the reality of life is that uh, even if you're highly uh, skilled from a technological perspective, and highly smart and business savvy and so on, it's highly, very, very rare to have someone which have in the same brain the mindset of uh, wanting to fight uh, data entropy and find patterns, and the mindset of just making things work at the same time. And so a, a usual human resource question you end up having, I think, in uh, many situations, is in terms of uh, setting up your team, would you prefer and co try to combine different skill sets with the challenge of making them work together? Or just try to hire data scientists that will in possibly independently uh, work and get things done? In my perspective, but that's, uh, you, you end up having uh, this more often question of uh, having very different kind of people working on data today. You've got people that are, uh, well, obviously you've got the coders, meaning people that like to enter some text into a computer to interact with him, and the clickers, meaning people which have a more visual way of interacting with computers and are much more efficient this way. And so I guess that the challenge for any uh, uh, computing framework in the next few years is to make those two kinds of people actually, and actually make them work uh, together. So next, well, next, uh, Al has a, an, interest, an, an interesting challenge, which is, well, um, I don't know if you, well, in my perspective, the main reason for a data project to fail is, I don't know if you can guess, you, you just start a new project, you are like uh, uh, very ambitious, you set up a, a three months or six months roadmap over with a team of uh, two or three people to, to just break, get things done. And then after like uh, one, one week you discover that the data you need is not available. Mm -hmm. Meaning it's pretty common. Meaning most of the project I saw failing but were just failing because the data was not there. Meaning you think the data exists, but when you actually look at it, you actually notice that the tag you wanted to use to track usage was is actually not there or just on half of the user for uh, some crappy crappy reason and so on and so you just realize that you need to, to uh, just uh, need to re-implement things and wait six months before uh, starting the project it kind of makes sense that, that having data is uh, such a big problem because also in my, in my experience and I will uh, have to, to kind of uh, figure that out at some point when you start a data analytics project, 
Meaning if you've got the right data and the right business problem, you usually almost solved half of the problem. Then you have to kind of uh, try to figure out what variable you need actually to use and combine and transform to get things done. And so the kind of uh, mystic data science uh, algorithmic part is just like uh, the last 10 or 20% of the job. So a question for Al is how oh, shall he actually get data? And so I, I like to think about three strategies for getting data uh, that I named after three nice animals. The cicada, the spider, and the fox. The Chicada strategy, well, uh, I don't know if you know uh, the, the poem by La Fontaine, the Chicada, but basically the Chicada in, the po in a poem from La Fontaine is, a, is an animal which is basically singing all the summer. As you know, Chicada, do during the summer. And uh, when winter comes, and they sing all along, basically they are starving. So the Chicada is highly optimistic as an animal. And so a Chicada strategy is basically if you're a startup to uh, wait uh, for uh, some open data to come around and just exploit it as a source of your data. You must be very optimistic about open data. But sometimes it works. And so as a company, uh, the Chicada strategy is obviously uh, just to wait that someone set up a data lake or a data hub with uh, data available, which this strategy can work in some situations. You really need to be optimistic. The spider strategy, well, it's basically about creating a network. That, well, that's the strategy of all the big companies from the digital world, especially Google, which is about setting up a network of uh, whatever trackers, cookies, and so on to collect the data. It's an expensive strategy because you do really need to build the network, and usually today, to get the data, you need to provide something for free, like a, a nice uh, API or some swag. Well, you don't have any trackers in the t-shirts, don't worry. And so, uh, well, obviously inside the company, it would mean like build a service against which people inside the company uh, would connect and provide their data accordingly. And then inside corporation, the most popular strategy would be the Fox strategy, which is basically to hunt for the big problem. So as a startup, you are a Fox if, uh, well, you try to get to uh, a big company a big corporation and say that uh, you would solve their uh, biggest problem using big data for a fair price. And so you get the data, you build a solution, a predictive model and so on, and then you try to replicate as a SaaS platform that you sell then to all the competitors of the first company you sell to. That's the first strategy. It's very popular to actually bootstrap your startup. And so inside the company, the strategy for uh, uh, for Fox is usually to get to the CEO or uh, someone high enough in the food chain to say that you can solve the biggest problem of the company using big data, possibly get one or two millions of budget to get those things done. Then, well, obviously, you will change the actual nature of the problem you can actually solve after having the budget, then, but then you still need to prove the value of big data and so on sufficiently in order to have your budget increased over the next year. And possibly with the budget, you get the approval of the CEO to actually get into the different databases of the company in order to build your solution. So the Fox is it's a really smart strategy. And so I hope that uh, I will uh, become a Fox. Then, the last uh, problem of Al in my perspective once he has like technology, people, and data, is that he, well, he actually needs to build something, meaning something that makes sense from uh, the perspective of the product sold by the company. And so we have to take maybe a, a small step back. The, the question is, at the end, what big data is about? What is the true goal of big data? Big data, uh, five or eight or 10 years ago, I don't even remember uh, how old uh, big data is. It was, uh, well, in, the, in our mindset at least, something about like, something like uh, the fact that Google could uh, use all the search logs in order to predict or find correlation between some keywords and 
to the fact that the flu epidemic was actually starting in a particular country. And so basically, possibly be able to predict the flu uh, two weeks in advance. Well, it turned out not to be true, uh, the fact that you can actually use this data for real, but that was uh, the mystique around big data. Today, the mystique about big data is more about uh, let's build data-driven products, like uh, we have all those new data sources with like data, connected device, location data, and so on, and we need to build completely new uh, products, highly intelligent, uh, highly intelligent, and so on. And so, the reality behind it, like, you got this guy, I mean, the analyst, and so in the first phase of big data, people in uh, being analysts had, were uh, getting more traction. It was getting more traction. It was a very popular job just because you had more data to visualize. In my perspective, if Al, uh, in order to Al to find the, the right objective, you need to understand that at some point, the, the actual goal of big data would be to actually automate decisions, not just like. Uh, provide more insights with larger data to help you take decision, but actually having a machine take the decisions, which is a big step. Another perspective for Al is obviously that he needs to uh, involve the product teams if, he, if, he, if he, he wants to be actually successful. So involving product teams, meaning uh, in the most successful teams I saw, uh, product managers and designers were highly involved in the design of uh, new algorithms. Because basically you need to understand what kind of user experience you can and want to provide to your users when you set up the algorithms. Another thing I must focus on is possibly when you choose the, the first problem uh, of that uh, this data team tries to solve, is to focus on the added value, on actual added value, meaning uh, most successful data teams won't start by like a side problem of the company, but they will start to, to work on, a, on the possibly more, most complex problem the company has, and that can be solved with data. And last but not the least, uh, obviously, in order to be successful, Al must uh, create some API culture inside his team, but also uh, uh, all around the team for all the people using data, meaning uh, do not just set up teams that would share some piece of code, some piece of code or some results of our email, but uh, we would build uh, actual APIs. So at the end to wrap it up, uh, the big question for Al is, well, in my perspective, uh, what's good is that today I can find a, a, a solution against all those problems uh, with data. We can build a, a platform uh, open enough, uh, connecting all the technologies, and uh, can set up a team and so on. Well, obviously, uh, our perspective as a company was to help him, help him uh, get those things done by uh, building a platform and a software as you can imagine. And uh, our uh, particular perspective is uh, to uh, actually provide it and uh, make it uh, accessible enough so that you can uh, download software, download our software, connect it to your Hadoop or whatever platform you have, load some very, very dirty data. The dirtiest data, the more we like it. And uh, cleanse it and build the predictive models in two minutes. So even if you're not a data scientist. And I think that whatever happens, that's the challenge for uh, next generation analytics, which is that anybody within the data teams or even within the corporation can actually leverage those technologies in order to get things done with data. I will be happy to take questions. If any. Can you talk a little bit about the open source? What 
I think that the, big, the biggest factor when you try to set up your stack is. Uh, you the yeah. So the question was uh, to talk about uh, the various open source technologies and uh, what factors to consider in order to choose the technology. Yeah, like yeah. NoSQL, Streaming, Kafka. What what should I? What is what, what is their fill? What are the use cases? Yeah. Okay. So obviously that's a very broad. Uh, that's a very broad question. Yeah, I just give a general idea. Like, you can answer it. <laughs> so um, I get that today. Today, well, in, in today's analytics, you've got two large use cases in analytics. One which would be batch processing oriented, like uh, I've got those logs and my customer data and so on over the last year, and I want to understand things about my customers, build the score for my customer and so on. Pretty static. And the other kind of use cases would be highly dynamic, like I want to be able to capture in real time information about my users, and depending on what they did over the last uh, minute, to be able to take a decision and change the behavior of my website, or raise an alarm, or detect a fraud, or whatever the use case. And so uh, understanding this aspect, what is the category of your use case, is a key factor for determining what is a, what is a key technology for you. Yes? Uh, do you know IBM modeler, SPSS modeler? It's a similar lookalike uh, product, and I would like to ask, what is the difference? Because my company is using that one. Should we change to this data IQ thing? So the question was uh, about uh, IBM uh, Modeler, IBM SPSS, and what is uh, the difference between uh, IBM SPSS and a solution such as that IQ? That's a great question. Um, so uh, when, when we built that IQ, we had this particular uh, thing in mind, which is that for uh, too long, data management, meaning the fact that data must be organized and clean and transformed, and data modeling or machine learning, meaning uh, all the algorithms you use to actually build predictive models. So those two domains were highly separate. Meaning uh, you've got people doing data management and people doing machine learning. And they wouldn't go to the same schools. They would uh, cross on the streets and do not say hello to one another, basically. Like, ah oh, yeah, you're doing data management. I'm doing machine learning, you know? And then, oh yeah, that's a gig doing machine learning. <laughs> two different kinds of people. And so my perspective is that, at least today, if you want to be successful with data, well, you need to be able to combine both in a pretty intimate way. Meaning, just because uh, any interesting project is about getting a new data source and clean it and actually integrate it with another one, and also any interesting project do need at least a little bit of machine learning. That's what I'm And so one big, uh, different and important thing we have in mind when we design a product was the fact that the two pieces of the puzzle are actually tightly integrated inside a product. Meaning you've got like a spreadsheet experience to cleanse your data, but you can also build the predictive models inside the same kind of environment, which is a different perspective, I think. That's one difference, at least. Yes? So the, the question was about uh, what uh, did uh, C happen to Al when he, he, he using uh, when he's using our product? Uh, that's a great question. Well, first, uh, Al does not really exist. I mean, it's a fictional character. <laughs> if it was not clear. Um, then uh, the, the key uh, a key aspect for Al, you, you've got two big problems when you are Al, apart all the problems I mentioned. The first is about uh, actual go to market internal go-to-market, meaning when you are setting up, setting up a data team such as uh, uh, this one, you must be able to deliver results in like six months, max. And so, uh, the first thing we saw is that just because you have a platform that helps you get things done, you can actually achieve some results in a few weeks, hence grow, uh, uh, grow, uh, grow your, uh, your uh, visibility inside your company. First factor. Uh, second factor is the fact that when you grow a team with uh, 
uh, different profile when you try to scale the team. Let's say, well, you start like with three, five, 10, 20 people. You start to have like junior data scientist, senior data scientist, junior analyst, senior data analyst. You really need to get things organized. You really need to be able to have people do their job in an environment that you control and where you can reproduce things and so on. Just because you cannot just uh, rely on the fact that everybody will document things on their own and stay in the company for five years. The data scientist you just hired might just find a job at Google uh, next year, leaving you with uh, all the stuff he did in a not so documented way. And so using platforms such as ours enable teams to scale in a kind of a sustainable way, which is a pretty, uh, I guess, a pretty important factor. Yes? What size of the data that uh, cleans in a two minutes like? So what size of data um, do we see as a data we clean? That was the question. So that, uh, means if we can clean in a two minutes. When, when we did, sorry, can you repeat? What size of the data we can clean in a two minutes? As you mentioned uh, last, uh, in your last discussion, that mm, we can have with this product uh, that we can clean in a two minutes. So my question is what size of the data it cleans in a two minutes? So in terms of size of data, yeah. um, so the question about was about the size of the data to cleans. Uh, we saw, well, I, I saw data set to cleans uh, ranging from uh, 100 lines to uh, 10 terabytes, which I actually, actually showed. Uh, obviously, you don't have the same data cleansing problem at all the scales. But uh, in reality, you do need some tools at all, those, at all those scales because, well, even if it's like 100, uh, uh, lines file, if you do the data cleansing just uh, in Excel, like by copy pasting and doing it manually, if you've got like two more lines over the next day, you just need to repeat the process. And all your analytic analytical workflow becomes a manual workflow with uh, someone behind. And the truth is, in, it's the case in too many organizations that the analytics workflow do need someone to watch over uh, each data set of 100 lines to, to check that uh, there is not uh, two more rows with some cleansing needed. And obviously, uh, the other aspect of cleansing is at the size of a few terabytes, where I think a big challenge for our organization is to enable analysts to work on logs, like web logs, or I don't know, Twitter data, in kind of this kind of massive data set that do not fit on a laptop, and just do some processing on them get the log with an IP address and be able to just transform it into a, a geolocation that they can draw on a map on their own without asking IT for the first the permission to get the data, second the permission to create a table in a database to get the data, then actually get the ship down, then blah, 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 blah. Um, in your experience, like, how, how many people are doing uh, any data pipeline analytics in-house, and how many people are using cloud things like Azure Machine Learning or AWS or Databricks? What's, how many people do you think roughly? Um, th that's a great question. I would say that to, today, um, ah, that's a, I, I wouldn't have like a firm statistics, but I would say that uh, a good one third to one half of people setting up a new Hadoop cluster, I mean, that would have set up a new Hadoop cluster uh, in the last year, would have used a cloud-based infrastructure to do so, at some point. At least for the very first step, which are to uh, setting up the first version of the uh, Hadoop infrastructure, and where you are not so sure about the size of the cluster, how many machines you want, and so on, and where scalability helps you a lot. Then some companies, when they I figure out what would be the size of the data lake. Go down to on-premise again. Oh, it depends, but uh, it's uh, it's becoming highly popular to do so. It was not the case two years ago, in my perspective, because it was not so easy, in fact, to have really label the uh, big data stacks on the on the cloud. And it's customizable enough that people, uh, if they do the cloud way, I mean, they're happy. So again, it depends on, uh, again, you've got all the Technoslavia, so you've got all combination, all possible combination of technologies uh, that you can use. Uh, 
people are generally satisfied with their experience in Hadoop uh, over Azure or uh, Amazon, in my perspective. You got uh, choices of technologies such as Databricks, uh, which are highly packaged, but also uh, possibly do not let you install anything you want on top of your cluster, so you possibly have some uh, issues in terms of combining different technologies, and so yeah. Yes? To, to repeat the question, uh, yeah, but it's a great question about the trade-off between visual tools and uh, basically uh, classic classical coding tools. So in my perspective, it's possible not to have to make the trade-off up to some point. And that's, uh, in fact, the, the one core idea we had. And here's the uh, meaning. Uh, because in many real life projects today, uh, the project is that big that it cannot just be done by one guy. In many situations. And uh, it also happened that uh, you actually need to have like, you are more effective if you've got like one guy who would be more like the exploring kind of guy and one guy which would be more the uh, coding, uh, core algorithms and uh, complex stuff kind of guy. Just because the visual guy would be more effective in uh, presenting results or uh, achieving business results or uh, exploring the data or the visual guy would be more knowledgeable about the initial data sources and obviously uh, the core uh, algorithmic guy can do uh, things at scale or uh, I don't know, uh, apply an algorithm in a scalable way. And so in our perspective it's possible and that's something we try to, to design in our tool is to have a workflow where some pieces can be visuals and some pieces can be actually piece of code that you can actually edit and version online in a GitHub environment and so on. So that the coder can actually package things for the visual guy. And um, in my perspective, it makes sense to have this kind of uh, hybrid tools for data because when you are using data, you, just, you don't have just code. In fact, in any real life situation, you've got code and data. And any real data projects and results. And you need to be able to explore the results each time you've got code and so on. And so, uh, when you are doing just coding, you essentially have in those situations a stateless kind of system when you are designing it. When you are building a data product, you've got a highly stateful system where you need to be able to explore the data and so on. And it's not true that you can recompute everything from scratch every time. Check 
here might be a different one that we focus on the model and actually does the model and things like that. Yeah, but that's a, a, a trade off uh, and a tension that uh, exists uh, during the project, in fact, during any, da in any uh, data project in the city. Do we, yeah? something is not supported, some component of the whole puzzle not supported in your uh, package. So can we enhance it, uh, kind of plug, plug in for I mean, new technology which is not there? So yeah, the, the, question, the question is about uh, whether we have uh, plugins inside our product. And so the answer is hopefully yes. We do have uh, plugins. So you can write uh, plugins in uh, Python, in R, in uh, Java, in order to extend the functionality of the product. And so, for instance, uh, to give you an example, we've got plugins to connect to uh, uh, various APIs or uh, to use uh, machine learning technologies that are not uh, built in within the product. Yes? What is the difference between SSAIS? Means a SQL Server Analytical Services, that is easy, or this one is easy? Which one is easy for the non-technical person, or a lay technical person? So, um, in my perspective, uh, SQL Server Analytics and, uh, and, the, and the, um, associated uh, stack. Yeah, means SSAS stack, like we build the cube and data cube, and we uh, finally come up with the data analysis. So that is easy, or this one way it's a fast and easy for non-technical or a rich technical people. So um, uh, I would say that in order to compare the two, the, the main difference is that they do not have the same goal, kind of, uh, do not uh, match the same kind of uh, use case and scenario. Uh, you've got one scenario and you basically already have the data, like uh, already an event table which was built by uh, an IT team, in fact at some point, and where the key question is how oh, you want to uh, aggregate the data in order to build your reports. And so in my perspective, the business intelligence, existing business intelligence stacks would be uh, SQL Server based or Tableau or Click already answers this question pretty well in, in a way that is usable by uh, most people that do need to use uh, those tools. You've got um, but, uh, in the new use cases uh, that we try to cover, the key question is about uh, integrating, well, answering all the questions that were not taught before and integrating data that was not previously integrated. Meaning, uh, what happens if uh, you've got some uh, external data like uh, whatever, a CSV file, either small or big, that you want to use in order to change your uh, uh, interpretation of your inner data. What if you want to, to use a particular column in a log that was not integrated by IT? And so the thing is, as uh, analytics becomes more advanced, uh, there is a need for analysts, meaning that are not so technical, to be able to do those things on their own. And in my perspective, that's a key driver of uh, uh, making, things work, making things work in uh, analytics, is to help uh, analysts be independent. That may be all the time we have tonight. Yeah. Let's have a great big thank you. To <laughs> you. <laughs> Florian is here for one-on-one -on -one questions. Feel free to come right up and ask him. There's also some extra stickers and keychains here.